Where better to introduce ourselves to this beautiful city than from the upper level of the Eiffel Tower at a height of 900 feet? Paris, the queen of Europe's cities, lies at your feet. If the symbol of Rome is the Colosseum, then Paris's is without doubt the Eiffel Tower built for the World Fair of 1899. Altogether, 1,050 feet in height, the Eiffel Tower is an extremely light, lace-like structure comprised of no less than 15,000 pieces of metal welded together, built at a time when architecture underwent radical changes. Glass, iron and steel were the new construction materials. On the other side of the city, a new edifice has been erected, the Grand Arch, which although providing some great views, I doubt will rival the popularity of the Eiffel Tower. The Palais de Justice forms one wing of the Conciergerie, a severe and imposing building dating from the beginning of the 14th century. It was from here that Marie Antoinette on the morning of October 16, 1793, at 7 a.m., climbed on the t onto the timbrel and took her to the scaffold. A more cheerful subject is the Opera House, where many, who I am sure are not opera lovers, enjoy the sun-drenched steps during their lunch hour break. Not far from the opera is the Madeleine, a Greek temple erected by Napoleon in honor of the great army. It is built in the classical Greek form on a high base with a large stairway in front and a colonnade of 52 Corinthian columns. As you leave the building, your gaze takes in the whole length of the Rue Royale, as far as the obelisk in the Place de la Concorde, and to the Palais Bourbon beyond. No visitor would dare to leave Paris without a trip on the Seine, on one of the Bateau Mouche, for from them we can see many of the beautiful buildings and much of the life of this city. Perhaps it is a replica of New York Statue of Liberty which suggests to the Parisians that degree of liberty which they appear to enjoy so much. Markets have a fascination for everyone, both the local doing the daily purchases and the tourist inquisitive of another's goods. Paris markets are gay and colourful, with every conceivable kind of produce, however devotee. The origin of the Louvre dates back to the 13th century when Philip Auguste had a fortress built near the river for defensive purposes. Developments over the centuries have made it one of the great museums of the world. In 1981 restructuring work took place and these large glass transparent pyramids are the connecting link between the new rooms and the surface. The long queues waiting admission are a testimony to the public's appreciation of the art held within its walls. We move forward from the Louvre to the Tuileries Gardens, on one side of which lie are the arcaded shops of the Rue de Rivoli and on the other the Parisians and their river. In a straight line lies the Champs-Élysées, designed in 1667 and once the most fashionable upper-class meeting place in Paris. It still has beauty and elegance. 
Luxurious shops, theatres, famous restaurants and important airline offices line its wide paths, which are always full of Parisians, tourists and a cosmopolitan throng. Finally, the Champs-Élysées ends at the Arc de Triomphe. Many of the victories of Napoleon are rendered on its face and under the arch is the tomb of the unknown soldier. From whatever part of the city you survey the panorama of Paris, your eye finally comes to rest on the white domes of Sacré-Cœur as it stands majestically on top of the hill of Montmartre. It was difficult to guess what this young lady was doing or saying, but she appeared to be enjoying herself for all that, for Montmartre is certainly the place for the exhibitionist. This is the area where many of the nightclubs and sex shows are to be found, the home of bohemian life, the home of the artist. The painter who lived as a painter and lived only for his paintings has changed today, but this perhaps is not true of at least one place, the Place du Tertre. It would be foolish to come to Place du Terche and the tiny streets surrounding it, looking for traces of the atmosphere of the good old days, or time has brought changes. But that way of painting, slow and absorbed, sitting on a stool or a small chair in front of the easel, this has remained the same as it was many years ago. There are no famous monuments in this tiny tree-lined square. The monuments are people themselves who live and work here and to fill its narrow streets, its little old shops and smoke-filled cafes with colourful but tranquil lives. In 1605, Henry IV decided to change a deserted district into an elegant walk place for its inhabitants. This square is now Place de Vosges, the oldest large square in Paris, completed in 1612. It is here you find the Victor Hugo Museum, once his dwelling place. Galleria Lafayette, the Meyer or David Jones of Paris. Certainly no better, but Paris's renowned departmental store. Close by is the Rue d'Edimbourg, a small side street where can be found a small hotel, Hotel Brescia, where this film team stayed in 1958. The left bank commonly known as the Students' Quarter or the Latin Quarter. Students came to Paris from all over the world and at the end of the 13th century numbered 15,000. The name Latin Quarter comes from the fact that until 1789 Latin was the university language. It was indeed used by the students and teachers alike in their daily life. This district, renowned for its artist displays and bookstalls along the river, also has its fruit and vegetable market, where the local and student rub shoulders in search of their daily provisions. Of the many illustrious buildings which occupy this quarter, we just had time to glimpse the Pantheon built as the church of St. Genevieve in fulfilment of a vow made by Louis XV during a severe illness, but now a non-religious temple housing the remains of many famous people. Our short stay in Paris culminates at the Cathedral of Notre Dame, surely the most beautiful religious building in the capital.
and one of the masterpieces of French art.